and it's 10 a.m. right here in Lagos, Nigeria. Good morning, good evening. Wherever in the world you're watching from is Business Morning Live from Channel's global headquarters right here in Lagos, Nigeria. Thanks for uh, starting your morning, uh, your morning with us right now as we track um, your money. Let's take a look at the markets now. We see the equities market increased again in yesterday's trading as our key indexes reached the all-time high. The all-share index uh, at some point at intraday touched the 60,000 point level but closed at about 59,985 points with sectoral performance um, hitting levels not seen in a while. We'll get more details on drivers of that market later on on the show. In the digital currencies market now, Bitcoin fell to $24,820 um, in early Asian trading um, this morning. It's the lowest uh, since the asset has traded since March 16th, uh, three months ago. Uh, $1,000 was shaved off the price of Bitcoin in less than an hour, uh, resulting in a daily loss of 3.6%. And to the global uh, grains market now, we see U.S. corn and soybean futures edge higher today as concerns of dry weather conditions in the Midwest uh, curb crop uh, prospects, while uh, wheat that fell on profit taking. The most active corn CV1 on the Chicago Board of Trade uh, rose about 0.33% at $6.09 for three quarter of a bushel while uh, traders are monitoring headlines from war-torn Ukraine and the Black Sea grain export region. All eyes on that deal uh, to see where prices go next. Uh, to the global um, oil market, now we see oil extended uh, declines today after the previous uh, day's plunge. Uh, Brent crude futures dipped 21 cents, about 0.3% to $72.99 a barrel, while US WTI crude fell uh, 20 cents, about 0.3%, at $68.07 a barrel. What's the drill down? What's driving that market on the commodities uh, market update? And Nigeria has regained its position as the top crude oil producer in Africa for the month of May, according to the latest report by the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. The report shows that Nigeria's oil output increased by 15.6% to 1.3 million barrels per day in May from 1.1 million barrels per day recorded in April this year. The latest data comes amid growing debate over how accurate the oil production uh, measure, measurement system is in the country. In April, Nigeria experienced its first decline in crude oil production, reporting a daily output of 999,000 barrels per day. And Nigerians may have to grapple with the current price of fuel for a while as, the, as Nigeria's uh, midstream and downstream petroleum regulatory authority says the price will largely be determined by the strength of the Naira against the dollar in a foreign exchange market. That's according to the chief executive officer of the regulatory authority, Mr. Farouk Ahmed, was speaking after a meeting with head of, uh, of oil marketing companies in Abuja yesterday. He, however, gives assurances to ensure uh, ensure uh, that petroleum products are available as already processing licenses for independent marketers who desire to import fuel into the country. Take a listen. Years of negotiations have culminated in this meeting in Abuja, where finally the Nigerian Midstream and Downstream Petroleum Regulatory Authority is given the license for the establishment of the Belema Suite Export Terminal to the company's president, Mr. Jack Rich. Seated here as stakeholders involved in these negotiations, and as stated by the chief executive of the authority, celebrations are in order as this license is among the first set of licenses to establish such terminals authorized by the authority. Subsequent to these licenses, terminal establishment notice are to be published in the Federal Government Gazette, which will make it a legal uh, process. As the authority chief executive signs the license, making it a legal tender, he hands it over to the president of Belema Oil Producing Limited, Mr. Jack Rich, who breaks down the impact this export terminal will have on Nigeria's economy. This license awarded to Belema Street Export Terminal that is cited in. We agree that anybody will continue to import. Yeah, until such a time when we have a critical mass of other importers. Now, licenses, of course, we are, like I said, we are processing them. 
you know, some about two or three marketing companies already came to us last week to say they have already uh, uh, booked cargoes to come in July. So these are some of the very interesting things that we have received, uh, or proposition that we have received, which are very much interested in and we're fast tracking the process of issuing their licenses to, to import. Again, we are interacting a lot every day with NMPC to ensure that yeah, the market is already well supplied and there is no gap in, uh, in uh, importation. This price that we, the NMPs rolled out, uh, uh, which were the sale now, took cognizance of the exchange rate not being at NMPC rate. So they used the exchange rate of about 650 Naira per dollar. So if the, market, if the, if the, if the Naira improves, then the, the price will change. If the, so it can go either way. Right, now to our first conversation, well, the, the Naira is back in the news again. Yesterday, the Central Bank of Nigeria directed deposit money banks uh, to remove the rate cap on the Naira, the official investors and exporters window of the foreign exchange market, to allow for a free, uh, a free float of the national currency against the dollar and other global currencies. Well, let's gauge the positives and expected neg negatives from this. Joining me now is uh, Mr. Ayodeji Ebo, MD Optimus by Afrinvest. Join us via Zoom. Great to have you on the show. Good morning. Good morning, and thanks for having me. So I guess this is what, you know, experts and economists have been clamoring for, but this is good news, but it, it does come with some, you know, negatives. Tell us, how much pain uh, can we expect from this while telling us, you know, the positives? Okay, thanks. I think um, it's, it's really a good move, and like you rightly said, is what we have been clamoring for because there's the saying that market will always win. So what we currently have is allowing markets, a willing buyer, willing seller, to prevail, and there will always be a price. There will be call price discovery. Over time, initially, uh, we may see some knee-jerk reaction, everybody being skeptical, both the buyer, both the seller, trying to see where the floor, where there will be a middle point is expected in any market. And over time, once everyone sees there's confidence, what we would expect to see is that we would begin to see more inflow channeled through the official market. So you, uh, be, uh, staying with your question, where you say starting with the pain, some of the initial pain that we we'll see is that we may see an adjustment in the fuel price. Uh, uh, thankfully, the interview before my, uh, my interview, uh, the NMPC said, chairman or said about, they used about 650. As I yesterday, it closed at 664 um, at the investors and exporters window, which is now the only official uh, window or the rate that is recognized. So uh, you would see that if we are importing at currently, you look at the parallel market, which we also call there's the inflow dollars at that level where you get this as I yesterday or as I this morning was at seven um, seven sixty five. So you would see that if you are going to import at seven sixty five compared to the six fifty price that we're enjoying now. It means the fuel price would in, would um, increase. However, we expect that as demand improves. So one thing we need to note is that what has been uh, what has been making that particular market, which um, inflows the uh, CBN staff of inflow, is because of the policy. Now we looked at the in 2020. I think estimate was that remittances in the diaspora is about 20 billion dollars. Where have they been going? Nobody wants to bring in money and come and sell and convert at 464. Export proceeds. Most people had, had made arrangement of where the exports would stay instead of bringing in the dollars, or they find a way of exchanging the dollars at the, un, at the unofficial market. So these are the things that we we'll begin to see. When you also look at foreign portfolio investors and foreign direct investors, it dropped significantly. Looking at uh, last year's number, FPI dropped to about uh, $1.2 billion, and FDI about $240 million. So you would see that all those things dried up. So we expect that, yes, while there would be initial pain, 
And it's also good to know before I wrap up this is that 80% of Nigerians already have been patronizing the 775 market. So we don't expect prices of imported goods to increase significantly because most people currently get their dollars at the over 70, uh, 70 naira. That's the unofficial market, the parallel market. Uh, so with what we are seeing, we expect that parallel market should even appreciate if CBN backs this policy up with demand as well as reviewing the exclusive list. All right. You know, talking about the, the black market now, is there a risk, you know, the, the rates we see in the black market is going to move further away, you know, from this um, official uh, official window, this INE window um, rate that we have right now? Is there a risk of that happening? And how do we, you know, stop that from happening? Is it by um, the CBN making sure that there is enough supply of dollars in the market? And what, what really happens to the BDC market? What happens to that business, really? Okay, thanks. I think you've even answered My own the question. question. But you, uh, the supply is key. So, and we know that there are also backlogs. So what I would expect the CBN to do is that they need to be aggressive now clearing the backlogs. Yes, we may not know the true picture of what our reserves are, but with confidence, it will grow over time. Even if it depletes by 10 billion in the next one month, once there's confidence, we begin to receive inflows and that would help boost the reserves. So that supply is critical. If not, would it would begin to see that disparity. I also mentioned that there's an exclusive list of our 43 items. There's, now that it's only one rate, there's no need. You can, if you need dollars for anything, since there's no subsidized dollars, just there should be no exclusive list. If, if the bank is willing to sell to me, I want to buy euro bonds, for instance, is on the exclusive list. People have to source from the unofficial markets to invest in euro bonds. So, why do, so that needs to be done. If not, then there will need to be, uh, they will see that disparity. The long-term fix is trying to work on things that we can begin to export that will generate effects. But in the interim, if, if we don't back up these policies with uh, follow it up with clearing backlogs, increasing supply, as well as reviewing the, or even taking out, the, there's no need for any exclusive list, then um, we may just be back to um, maybe five, from five pound to five, if I'll put it that way. Yeah, definitely a good time to be export, you know, dependent uh, for the country and, um, you know, finished goods, exportation of uh, finished goods at this point. But what does this mean for government debt? Now, we see external debt, about $42 billion um, dollars um, last I checked, uh, but that was quoted at the old rate, about 463 um, naira. So with this you know, um, devaluation of this uh, float um, right now for the INA window. What does it uh, do to government debt, external debt, that is? Okay, thanks. I think, um, yes, when we look at it based on the calculation, definitely is really going to increase. So if you have, um, but because we also hand dollars, I'll believe that it's, it's going to be in netting. If you hand dollars and you have loan in dollars, then you should be paying it with dollars. It means you are hedged. Then the issue of whether interest um, exchange rate moves up and down will not bother you. So once we fix also the oil theft and we're able to get more proceeds, you know, the removal of subsidy would also help CBN, um, NMPC to be remitting more dollars to the CBN. And with that, I think that it would also be able to, uh, also be able to bridge that gap. And um, talking about, you know, the gap um, right now, what, what do you think um, should be the plan of action, you know, to create some kind of buffer? Because this will definitely, you know, impact markets. Okay, thanks. Uh, so for the, for Nigerians, I believe that for most importers, currently they have been importing at the 775 Naira to a dollar for builders, for most, even for trading euro bonds. Most people have been doing businesses at the inflow dollar. So if the CBN is able to back this up with supply at the high and new window, what we should even see is an appreciation of the dollar at the uh, parallel markets. Because now there's, it has taken away speculation 
PTA, BTA for all those that run trip, there's no incentive for people to buy and want to resell. So that would close the gap as we progress. So I, I think that um, the fix is to follow it up, uh, follow it up uh, with that supply such that Nigerians will not feel that, that impact um, significantly because right. if it's not followed up, we'll, we'll see that shift um, in the parallel markets. And, and definitely, most people now, you know, that want to uh, buy stuff, you know, online, abroad, they've not been able to use their bank cards, you know, to, you know, make some of those purchases. What do you think, you know, happens now? Will, will Nigerians be able to use their Nigerian uh, bank cards to shop, you know, abroad again, like before, uh, before we, we, we got that disruption? Yes, definitely. Within a short period, once we begin to see that supply, it all still ties down to supply. The reason why the bank stopped it was because they were not receiving sufficient dollars. And now, once that supply is consistent, then most of the banks, because they also want to hand the fees, it's not also for free. The fees on those transactions would be positive for the banks. So I believe that um, uh, for, uh, for those that now have um, dollar-denominated loans, I, I forgot to mention that it's going to be negative for them because if your revenue is in Naira and you have borrowed in dollars, it means you need more Naira. But overall, what this adjustment has done is it has re effectively reduced the demand. If 10 billion was being, was the demand was being put down to purchase dollars, it has reduced it by 29%, giving that exchange rate. So the purchasing power uh, for those that have been accessing it at the official markets would have reduced significantly. And um, let's look at the, the, the stock market. Now, we've seen that, you know, bullish trend, you know, for a while now. What does this do for po foreign portfolio investors? Do we expect them back, you know, the capital market right here in Nigeria? I think, yes, I think we would see them come back to the market if we continue with consistency. You know, all this policy is even less than one week. Uh, but consistency is key. If we follow it through, it is expected because for them, they now know that it's a free market. You can come in anytime, you can go out. If they receive dividend, they can repatriate their dividend, which will be positive for us because in the last three or four years, the domestic investors has been the major, they have been the major driver of this market. And what we're seeing now is by the time they come in, prices would also increase. So we are seeing early bed positioning, especially for local investors in anticipation that foreign investors would also come to the market, when, which would mean that for those top stocks that they normally buy, we'll see major price appreciation in those stocks because fundamentals have still remained very strong. And some of these policies will also give opportunity for most of these companies to also expand as we progress in the medium to long term. All right, I guess um, so much to unpack and so much to um, look out for. Still early days, and uh, we hope this unification process uh, actually um, carries on along. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ayodeji Ebo, MD Optimus um, by Afri Invest. It was great having your perspective today. Thank you for having me. And now for the commodities uh, market update, we have Dumebi Oluwole, Senior Analyst, Financial Derivatives Company, um, joining us via Zoom. Uh, Dumebi, great to have you. Good morning. So it's official. The CBN has introduced the willing buyer, willing seller um, model for the ironing window. And Mr. Ebo did, you know, highlights the benefits and also the negatives. So tell us how this um, unification affects commodity um, prices and food prices uh, right here in Nigeria. Um, so the first thing to actually consider when we look at the exchange rate unification process is that what exactly is going to happen right now is a swift convergence between the official rate and the parallel market rate, meaning that the exchange rate, which is the price in the forex market, will trade closer towards um, the market determined rate, which is the black market rate. So anything between 600 to 751, um, that's where the exchange rate will trade. Now, the other thing to also consider is that what this means for Nigeria's exchange rate and regime and entire exchange rate system is that prices will be more reflective of what exactly is happening with forex demand and forex supply. Now on the part of forex demand, what we'd likely see is that um, demand would, would 
be consistent, right? Because the issue with um, forex, with the forex market has been that supply has not been able to meet demand. And then it also means that companies, individuals, um, and also the government will as, will access um, forex at this market determined a uh, market determined rate. Then we also look at then from the supply side of it, what it, what's going to happen is that th there are a few things to consider. Number one, we would likely see an increase in supply of forex, you know, um, at the I and E window, which is now going to be the official, um, which is now going to be the official rate because was most likely eventually we would not have a black market rate anymore. But right now that is still going to exist because there's still the Forex ban in place. There's still a lot of things to consider before we move towards a completely unified exchange rate. But like I said before, convergence, a very swift convergence is what Nigerians are going to see, what businesses are going to see. So then, like I was saying on the um, supply side of things, um, we have to consider what exactly makes a Forex, a forex supply for Nigeria today and that is um number one we look at all um crude oil uh um um crude oil revenues. And what exactly is happening with crude oil revenues today? We're seeing that our production levels are still suboptimal, meaning that forex supply will still be thin from that particular angle. So the, the expectation here is that as the government is making this move towards unifying the exchange rate and making it more market reflective, what we'd likely see as well is that um, what, 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 uh, um, the, what analysts also expect is that there will be commensurate efforts towards improving crude oil Oil production so that we earn enough we, we earn uh, um we earn enough um um forex to increase supply uh um, um significantly even though there is now the willing buyer willing seller um model then we also have to consider the fact that fpi inflows and fdi inflows make up a significant chunk of our forex um, um supply as well and we're already seeing that you know fpi investors uh, fpi inflows would likely increase we've seen what's happening with the what, what has happened with the NGX that has gained almost 7%. Seven, 7%. Um, we've also seen what's happening with Nigeria's euro bonds and also our bonds. So that shows an increase in investor sentiments and confidence towards the Nigerian economy. And we could see um, FPI inflows trickle back into the economy. Same as well with FDIs. Although with FDIs, they would the government would require a lot more push towards encouraging um, forex inflows from that angle. Then we look at remittances that also make up our forex supply, right? Um, with everything that is happening now, um, the, the expectation is that cross-border transactions between Nigeria and other countries will be easier. And that clearly means that remittance inflows will be easier to push into the country, making it making them um, further supporting our forex supply. So net, netting the effect, what we'd likely see is um, a more um, market-determined de exchange rate, um, a significant increase in um, forex supply um pending when the government you know um um support or um increases efforts towards encouraging um, or boosting crude oil production that makes a significant chunk of our right. forex supply depending all of this what would like what would likely see is supply will begin to meet demand the market the the forex rate itself which is the price will be you know um will be more um reflective of demand and supply trending towards what the parallel market rate is today that is around 600 to 751 so that's what would likely um see yeah. as for um yeah as for how you know um businesses and you know consumers how the impact of this so for businesses already businesses have been you know using a blended rate right manufacturers have been using a blended rate to access them um, to to get forex we've seen reports of them saying that oh you 90 percent of their forex names have been gotten you know at the parallel market rates so what this means is that there's really not we wouldn't, we wouldn't see so much change um, in the price at which they will get Forex because that's already what they get Forex at. What we would see is a change in their accessibility, meaning that Forex supply will be, would, would now meet their demand. And accessibility and is basically what we, what we yeah, need um, right now. Exactly, oh. exactly. So there'll okay. be less need for panic buying and speculation because um, there, there's increased transparency. As for prices, you know, um, not all commodities have um, the exchange rates that uh, have the exchange rates influencing their price, right? So 
just commodities like pasta, um, noodles, um, wheat, um, foreign rice. So those are the commodities that will definitely see um, an uptick in their prices just because of this um, um, change in exchange change in exchange rates. You know, yeah. So that's right. that's where the um, impact on consumers and businesses would land. Yeah. So so much to unpack um, there, definitely. But let's look at the inflation um, story now. We're, we're expecting inflation data for May um, later out today. We're currently at 22.22 percent. How is this going to play into inflation data for June? You know, seeing that is in this month we we had the subsidy removal, you know, for PMS, and now we have the unification, you know, of exchange rates. How is this going to play into that inflation story for June specifically? Yeah, yeah. Ladi, thank you very much for that. Um, I think you're already becoming an analyst at this point. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> Yes, yeah, so clearly you're, you're very right. Um, all of this will take will be more pronounced in June inflation numbers. So as for May, what would likely see is the impact of you know like the planting season and um, how you know um, the 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 just the immediate impact of the fuel subsidy removal because remember that the fuel subsidy removal actually happened three days before the end of the month. So we could see um, a minimal impact you know of that on inflation or on prices just um, this this. Um, in May, but in June, it will definitely be more pronounced. Same as well for the exchange rate unification. And the expectation is that it will definitely, you know, um, um, cause inflation to, to spike. Um, already, there are um, predictions that the fuel subsidy alone will add about two, add between two to three percent to um, inflation rates. Um, for, from what it is today. So those are the things that we expect for June inflation numbers um, that will be coming out soon. So food inflation, yes, we'll see an uptick there. Month on month inflation will definitely see an uptick, uptick there. Same as well for core inflation. And this is because PMS prices have increased, transport transport fares also um, have increased as well. So those are th th that's where um, inflation would would, would would settle for June. Yeah, and talking about inflation, we know the central bankers have been, you know, battling inflation since 2022, and we see the U.S. Fed, you know, for the first time, they've paused rates um, yes, at the uh, meeting yesterday. Obviously, investors were excited and expected that to happen, but there was also some bad news there. They expect more rate hikes um, going forward, and I'm sure that's what rattled um, global markets yesterday. Yes, um, that did. But analysts right now are playing the wait and see game, just trying to see how well um, this pause will actually take effect on the economy. So essentially what um, the US Fed is saying is we're pausing rate hikes now just to see how well what we've done in the past 10 months um, will take effect, and take effect on the economy. The expectation is that prices will begin to reduce a lot more and also um, 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 the, and also uh, re um, they're trying to refrain from causing the economy to overheat. And that's because um, the monetary policy transmission mechanism in the U.S. is really strong. So when interest rates increase, um, that's when the U.S. Fed funds rate increases, we see um, a significant uptick in um, the rate for commercial papers, treasury bills, mortgage rates, savings rates, you know, all of that. And remember that we're also coming from um, the recent... Um, um, the recent uh, uh, um, agreements for the for um, Biden and you know for the Republicans and Democrats as well to um, 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 stop the the U.S. debt ceiling, so the U.S. doesn't um, you know go on a default. And there were conditions that came with that. Meaning, um, and one of the conditions was that you know student loans as well, all of the um, freebies that came with the Biden administration will be halted at least in the interim. So meaning that people. People that were getting, um, you know, um, palliatives and all of that, we would see a, dif a significant decline on that. So the expectation is that with this pause, we, um, um, we, with, with this pause, um, we, we, we definitely would see, you know, the impact of the rate hikes take effect on the economy, um, because the expectation is that inflation would, you know, would, would might actually um, um, increase. But now that um, the U.S. Fed decided to pause rate hikes for now. We would see um, at least um, business owners and investors just take a little little breather in terms of like the cost of borrowing that is already high, and the, the likelihood of the U.S. economy um, overheating is already significantly down just based off of this pause. But right. because um, 
um, the US Fed is considering tightening. It's coming from that um, decision to, you know, um, Cause the debt ceiling just so the US doesn't have a default, the US doesn't default on its loans. And then the implication of that on inflation, because people will end up, you know, um, um, student loans that were, you know, paused for some time. So it, all those interest payments are going to come back up and, you know, definitely would bite on consumer disposable income. So that's where the um, increase in, um, um, that's where the increase in, in tightening as well, or the stance to continue tightening is coming from. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure the banks in the US. US too would also feel some kind of relief from this um, pause. But let's tap in on the oil markets now. We see oil prices are down um, today. What's driving sentiment? Well, generally, um, it's coming from, you know, the um, the uh, um, um, U.S. Fed's decision. So markets are weighing that. We're also seeing um, what's happening, like tensions between the U.S. and China. That is also having an impact on on um, you on, on prices. We've also seen news about um, U.S. crude inventories. So all of this combined are, you know, driving sentiments around crude oil prices. In fact, oil prices have actually been volatile. Um, in the past few past few days, and another, um, uh, um, but mostly tilting towards bearish sentiments. Um, Goldman Sachs, that's usually very optimistic about oil prices, is projecting a further decline, you know, in its forecast for what, where oil prices will eventually settle, you know, at the end of the year. So um, there's a lot of bearish sentiments uh, pervading the oil markets, and all of these things that I've mentioned are exactly what you know as exactly um the, the things that are fueling um sentiments and why oil prices are trending downwards today and i'm wondering what the saudi is going to do about you know getting these prices back up but keep watching i'm sure they have something you know obviously by this time but thank you uh, do maybe a senior analyst uh, financial derivatives company it's great having you today thank you thank you so much for having me all right now let's um head on to uh Oh, the markets. Yeah, the local boss. Now, let's see what's um, happening. We have Anete uh, with the details. And um, Anete, we're, we're breaking new levels in this market. Yesterday, at intraday, we did touch 60,000 level mm -hmm. for the all share index. We're we'll settled at 59,985 points. Still another, you know, incredible high. This market is really high right yeah, now. Yeah, another, another strong rally. And all this is happening in just, um, in just two weeks and very, very remarkable. And when you talk about um, the, the value, the term, in terms of value terms, it's almost an equivalent to what you've had in, in, in three strong rallies so far since the, since the 31st of May, which means as of yesterday, we gained about uh, 991.81 billion naira. And that means that high net worth investors are already pocketing, like take for example, Zenit Bank's um, CEO, according to reports, have it that he gained in just a few hours yesterday, gained about uh, 13 billion naira. Can you 13 that? Billion. 13 billion. And how billion. much did we make yesterday in that? Hour. In just in just one hour. Did you make any just, money in one hour yesterday? Oh, for now, for now, I'm just I'm just uh, right. I'll, I'll just be on the <laughs> analysis side. I'll Fantastic. talk about the investment side. Fantastic. Fantastic. So now, so for midweek transactions at the exchange, another another strong bull run, bull rally. Take a look at the board there, 3.13 percent. In contrast to what you had uh, previously, you had about a 4 percent increase on Tuesday's trading session, but another 3.13 percent is added to the all share index and now like uh, Ladi had mentioned a couple of uh, seconds ago that uh, we we touched the 60,000 level but so far this is another high uh, almost almost um, uh, one of the historic highs for the exchange which means that investors are really buying into this market and at the same time they're making money from the market take a look at that approximately 992 billion naira gain in just wednesday's trading session and as previously you'd had 1.22 trillion naira gain just on tuesday and 1.57 trillion naira gained in just one day now take a look at the activity chart the banking sector was the major rallying point there, although we had the shares of MTN Nigeria add its value to the market. But in terms of sectoral performance, you see the banking sector counter having 26.52% increase. That's a, quite a surge, one of the biggest surge ever that I have seen. And at the same time, the insurance sector also gained almost that same margin, more than 20%. But the only laggard there, which saw some uh, pullback, although the red, uh, red color there was the industrial goods counter, which is no thanks to profit taking on, the on that counter. Now, take a look at the activity chart. In terms of activity, another greenish color there, another bull run for there. Uh, investors are really buying into the stocks. We saw uh, about um, 70 gainers against 13 losers 
and then that market is showing so much vibrancy because of the announcement of the collapse of um, uh, multiple, uh, the abolishing of the multiple exchange rate by the central bank. Now, to give us more details about this, we'll be talking more about the fixed income market, but let's get to Babaji Desholanke, the head of assets and liability at FSDH Merchant Bank, to tell us more about the fixed income market uh, as today that we'll be expecting some figures from the, Nigerian Bureau, uh, from, from the National Bureau of Statistics. Thank you for joining us, Babaji Deh. Now, uh, thank you, Anete. Um, thanks for having me. Good yeah. afternoon. Good morning, rather. Yeah, I'm yeah. Like speak time here. Mm, morning. So now, um, I think I have. Uh, I think we have just about uh, two two minutes. But in that time, can you give us details about yesterday? There was a treasury bills auction at um, at the fixed income market. Today we will be expecting the inflation figures and then can you react to this report about the Naira which has been very much in the news. Some say it's a depreciation, some say it's an appreciation. Can you give us a clear detail on this uh, about the state of the Naira at, uh, at, the, at the Forex markets? Thank you Anati for having me. So it's clear that we're in an interesting time and that interesting time automatically means um, that so much is happening in the market, particularly in the financial market, like you mentioned, on fixed income side, and of course in the FX market side, which is also linked to the fixed income side. If you look at the you know, composition of the fixed income market, those of the holders of government securities, FPH has been among them, another investor, apart from the local, is that the activity we saw in the NCB market suggests that um, people always wanted, wanted to log you know, on into the, into the longest hand of the pub. And you can see that 32, about 32 billion matured at the longest end of 365 days for NTB. The demand was 277 billion. And the rate went to 8.24 for about 9.45, which suggests that one thing is clear. One, you can say excess liquidity in the system uh, of people wanting to just uh, lock in their, 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 their cash in, into, 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 into assets, particularly government securities at the short end of the NTB, and the available demand, uh, sorry, available supply. Which means that that huge you know, demand, you know, in the face of high liquidity, and people wanting to to keep the money in, in, in long term assets, particularly at the short end of the crisis, suggested that the rate went to eight point two four. Now that's interesting. We will link it to the to the to the to the um, to the current Naira devaluation. So I will call it a devaluation. Of course, the central bank didn't like that word. They prefer an adjustment in, in, in the former era of MFLA. But the clear devaluation, whereby you saw the NAPEX rate, which is the anchor on which the forward rate of government is based, um, closing the high earning window by, by implication, that's a clear devaluation, of course, further narrowing uh, the speculative and the subsidy that has been on the FX market. One thing is clear as we go forward um, that the new economic managers are going to manage the economy differently, are going to be having more inflow and half flow of capital that has been under capital control in the former era of the former CBN governor, are going to have the Exchange rate to the narrow, more determined by the fundamentals of the economy in terms of how much are we able to produce, how much are we able to sell, how much financing can we attract. So the implication is that fine, they've devalued, they've closed the gap significantly, the gap between the black market and okay. you know the other hand of the market has narrowed. But going forward, how okay. do we ensure that the force further? That's okay. a big question. New economy that needs to answer for us. Okay. So, uh, Babajide, so uh, we got just about uh, 60 seconds. Now, today, by 12 p.m., we should be expecting the May inflation report to be released by the National Bureau of Statistics, and it's currently at 22.22%. So, now, if it comes in higher, what are your expectations? What implications will they have on the fixed income market uh, for investor sentiment, you know, when, when you take into cognizance all the happenings um, in, 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 in recent days? Uh, the time is not enough. I'll just tell you this clearly. Historically, it has been proven that investors are not really particular about the real return on investment, which is taking out the yield or the return on investment, taking out from inflation. People have been having negative uh, real income in terms of when you take out the return on their investment compared with the inflation rate. Let's assume 8.45% NTP, subtracted from 22.22 latest inflation figure. Your return is negative, basically. Um, so that is not a perception. You know, the inflation rate will still come up higher. The fundamental factor driving the general inflation is essentially cost push factors in terms of higher cost of produce, production, which, of course, they said the subsidy savings will help to, um, help to improve the infrastructure so that they can bring down the inflation rate. Basically, in terms of reaction, people are still going to be having to keep their money in assets and um, bothering about high inflation and how the ultimate return in terms of when you subtract the inflation from your expected earnings is still going to be negative in the, in, in the short term. In the medium term, in the long term, by the time inflation begins to come down, by the time we improve infrastructure, we can begin to have positive return. So in terms of the expected inflation uh, in Nigeria, it's going to come higher. 
uh, particularly with the first subsidy removal and the higher increase in PMS um, supply and uh, the hand and the demand, you know, uh, still remaining the same. And people having to pay more, of course, feeding into other prices of production and consumption. So inflation will come higher in terms of participation, in terms of what would it do for in investment, particularly fixed income. And people continue to lock, lock in into, 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 into the fixed income, particularly yeah. because the inflation is interested to come down. Even if, if interest rate is going to come down in the future, it's better you buy now before it okay. comes down so that this keeps on value. Oh, okay. Okay. So thank you so much for your time, um, Baba Jide. And of course, like I'd always say, our eyes are always on the market. So that was Baba Jide Sholanke, Head of uh, Asset and Liability Management at Access at um, FSD Merchant Bank. Now, let's um, give you, before we run up that, let's take a look at the fixed income markets. For the, for the Treasury bills market, it was um, largely quiet. Uh, average yield there, that's because investors were uh, key, uh, anticipating the, re the release of that um, Treasury bills auction result uh, at that market. And then average yield there, it said, uh, was unchanged at 6.3%. But on the FMDQ exchange here, what you saw, the total number of deals, which was the loaner there, the 6th of June 2024 paper, that was the trade there, just five at 3.25 billion naira. Let's move over to the bond segment. The bond segment, bearish sentiment there. We saw average yield expanded by three basis points to about 13.8%. And across the benchmark curve, the average yield expanded at a short uh, at a short segment, where by four basis points, and then also at the long end, and then because investors there had sold of the March 2027 paper. Now take a look at the board here. That's uh, total total number of deals carried out there, nine at 3.79 percent across these market numbers there. So that's it for that market, right. uh, Ladi. Yeah, um, so as, as Sean said, that, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward uh, to a time where we see that positive, you know, real return. We've been, it's been negative, it's been negative all this while, and investors have, you know, carried on, you know, mm. with that. But we need to bring down the stubbornly high inflation yeah. to be able to yeah. enjoy. Yeah, and it's working now. Funny enough, it's working elsewhere, particularly in the United States, uh, as well as some other advanced yeah. country. But uh, exactly, with the Fed actually having the ability to pause with their rate hikes this time, quite mm. incredible. But also hike, uh, hinting of more hikes to come. More hikes to come. Thank you so much. Anisha. Pleasure. All right, I was Anita giving us the details uh, for the local boss and the fixed income market. Now let's head on to our London studios. Now we have Juliana standing by um, right there. Great to have you, Juliana. Good morning. Breaking news in the UK. We see um, their allegations. Boris Johnson uh, misled Parliament over Partygate. Uh, what are you hearing about this? That's absolutely right, um, Laddie. A big, big story in the UK this morning is that Prime Minister Boris Johnson, the former Prime Minister, um, misled a Parliament over Partygate. Now, um, Partygate was a term, a buzzword uh, that dominated Westminster discourse just as we were getting out of lockdown, as in, I believe, December 2021, a series of pretty incriminating pictures showing Boris Johnson who was then the Prime Minister and uh, senior Tory MPs uh, drinking excessively and having parties uh, when, of course, uh, the entire world was on lockdown and we were repeatedly told to stay at home. When those allegations first came to the Palace of Westminster on at least four or five, maybe even six occasions, Boris Johnson sweared blind um, that he did not, under um, any circumstance, realise that he was breaking social gathering rules. Uh, well, the Privileges Committee um, have concluded in a much hotly anticipated, eagerly awaited report that was just published this morning that, in fact, uh, the Prime Minister did mislead uh, Parliament. It's pretty important because, of course, um, Laddie, uh, one of the reasons why the British economy is in such dire states at the moment is it's because of the labour market. We've got record high uh, vacancies at the moment. We've got endless queues in the NHS uh, because hundreds of thousands of people are still suffering uh, from long COVID symptoms. Uh, there was so much fraud in many of um, the payout systems that the then Chancellor Rishi Sunak um, uh, put in place uh, to try and combat people staying at home. That's causing us uh, significant issues. And there is lots of information about the handling of COVID in this country 
country, which, by the way, led to hundreds of thousands of deaths. We have one of the most highest rates of COVID in the world, and people want answers. We're starting to get the beginning of this answers. Uh, we know that Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, did have foresight of uh, this document on Friday, which is uh, what led to him quitting as an MP. And now the knife has been stuck and he's back even further. And the Prime Minister has come out fighting. He has said of this 108-word document, 30,000 words, um, that the committee now says that I deliberately misled the House. This is Boris Johnson's own uh, statement this morning. And at the moment I spoke, I was consciously concealing from the House my knowledge of illicit events. This is where it gets sticky for Rishi Sunak because he says this is rubbish. Quote, it is a lie. In order to reach this deranged conclusion, bearing in mind he is an elite um, Eton alumnus, not surprised at that language there, the committee is obliged to say a series of things that are patently absurd or contradicted by the facts. Now, this is going to be a huge migraine uh, for Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, who at the moment, if there was an election tomorrow, according to the polls, uh, the Labour Party, Sir Keir Starmer, would win head and shoulders above him. Um, but this is an issue for him because, of course, we know that Boris Johnson is, uh, you know, part of the framework of the establishment. He believes that he is a victim of a political witch hunt. He has very, very strong allies within the party. In fact, two of them um, decided to quit alongside uh, Boris Johnson because they were so dismayed. There are lots of backbench Tory MPs at the moment um, criticising uh, the institution of the Privileges Committee. They're not happy that these findings um, have been um, concluded. And yes, like I said, there is a political uh, firestorm engulfing Westminster at the moment, laddie. Huge right. breaking news story here in the UK. Yeah, really huge. And we'll definitely keep um, tracking down and get more details uh, later on on business and corporate. But thank you so much, uh, Juliana. Always great to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now let's take a look at other markets. Now let's see what's happening there. We see uh, Bitcoin hammered uh, yesterday into this morning. Uh, we see the sentiment there, 41 points. Fear, more fear um, in the crypto market now. We've seen the whole regulation issue and, uh, with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. That's weighing on the market. And also uh, that decision we got from the um, U.S. Fed, which was a pause, which was good, but somehow turned bad with the forward guidance from the U.S. Fed there. Let's look at the um, top cryptocurrencies we track. We see Bitcoin there, 24,954. Remember, this was holding on to 26,000 um, before now. Big drop there, 3.49%. We see Ethereum, bigger drop, 5.45% down, $1,642. Remember when Ethereum was holding on to that $1,800 level, but now it's lost that going further away. And we see BNB also down 5%. It's big drops that we're seeing in the market um, right now. Let's bring in um, Rume of now, financial market analyst. Hello, Rume. Great to have you. Good morning. Great to have you too, uh, <laughs> Gladi. Fantastic. So, um, Rumi, it's all about the Naira, you know, right now. We got that unification um, order yesterday from the CBN. And I know that in, in the crypto market, there's that P2P, that peer-to-peer -peer exchange. You know, has it been impacted by what we've seen, you know, with the unification of the um, i &E window? Uh, Lani, the truth is, uh, the future of uh, finance is digital, and uh, Nigeria is not an exception to that. The young people, which constitute a huge number of our population, has decided to not be left out with all of this. The P2P area, which I also play in, is, a, is some sort of an informal sector in Nigeria, which I also uh, want to enjoy in the current administration uh, to also look into, is actually waxing stronger and stronger. Uh, with all of the fact that uh, uh, the the market now uh, it's uh, is now open, uh, it doesn't really affect the P2P transaction because people have actually seen that it is easier to transact. That is uh, using the stable coins, for example, uh, it has minimal volatility, right? Uh, when buying your uh, digital asset, crypto asset like Bitcoin, Ethereum, and a couple of that, that could fl fl fluctuate. You have seen it now that a couple of numbers, like 5%, 3% of a couple of things, and also uh, is good for savings and uh, is good to save with all of that because of the fact that you can always use it to buy uh, your preferred. Then also earning rewards. People use that too to earn rewards so you can stake your, uh, those familiar with uh, the industry could know when you stake it, uh, you get certain reward as a particular period of time. Then it has very 
I think the, the part where Nigerians, young Nigerians, are actually particular about uh, is the fact that it has very cheap transfer. Uh, that is, you can transfer money cheaply, and the, the fact that the international uh, ways where you know sending money could either have some network challenges or a couple of other things, maybe queues in the bank and all of those things. I think uh, uh, the stablecoin issue have actually uh, helped to for international uh, remittance. That is, those abroad receiving money and sending money, a couple of things, though not formal. So this is where I want government to come in to see how far they could bridge all of those gaps together, so that government can also make money. But the truth is, again, the future of finance is digital, and this is why all our, our young people are jumping into it. Digital, digital, digital. All right, let's look at the price of Bitcoin. I was hammered yesterday, but we got that good news from the U.S. Fed. It was a pause as expected, but you know that forward guidance did you know rattle the market, and we see how Bitcoin you know reacted to that. What are you expecting for um, price action for Bitcoin going forward? Ladi, you know I've always said this, and uh, like you heard, you say room the bear. You say room the bear. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the truth is that um, the market is uh, forward thinking, right? The market is forward thinking, and a couple of persons don't uh, want to uh, attack the market in that in that way. They want to preempt the market. They want to take the, they want to take action before the market even uh, do certain things. You know, so uh, we're going to see uh, a good downside also. For those that are not taking the opportunity to to dollar cost average, which is DCA, by buying gradually uh, till we see some uh, uh, opportunities backward, I think this is a this is a very big opportunity. Not a financial advice though, but we're going to see some downside because people are going to prioritize, and we're still going to see some shakeups here and there. You see all of the SEC issue with Coinbase and uh, Binance and a couple of other assets that are uh, said to be securities that are going to really be hammered very hard. Because the truth, truth has to be said, uh, uh, the, the, some of these assets are, so to say, uh, just noise. Some of them are Ponzi schemes. Some of them are not having any value. So they need to be all wiped out so that we have a very clean system. All right. I guess it's the big cleansing of the crypto market. Thank you so much, uh, Rumi Ophi. Always great to have your perspective. Thank you very much, Ladi. All right, let's look at the top gainers now. We'll see uh, TWT topping that counter. The only one able to ache up a two-digit gain there, 12.30%. percent uh, we see uh, Uniswap, or Decentralized Exchange, as a token for that exchange. It's up 5.10%, 4.48% uh, up. And we see Algorand, um, 11 cents, 1.69% uh, up. But no Algorand is also caught up in that U.S. SEC um, issue about it being a security. was mentioned as one of them, but we're seeing um, some kind of profit. Now, let's look at the top losers uh, this morning. See, um, curved out 9.74% down. Big losses we have in the market. Aave is also on that counter. $50.23 down um, 9.23%. So we see the market still um, quite negative right now. A lot of fear um, in this market and it is expected at this point. So that's how uh, the crypto market is looking. And that's a show um, today. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to join us at 1.30 p.m. on Business Incorporated for more updates and developments in the world of business. You can, you can watch this again, all over again on our YouTube channel. Just flip over to YouTube, uh, click on videos. You can watch all our production. Thank you again for watching. I'm Ladi Williams. Bye-bye.